This is CBC Here and Now. They don't get the benefit of the doubt. They need to show the proof. It was a very poor choice of spending. They are only in this election and in government for their own good. Tonight, reaction to a Liberal government deal to provide funding in exchange for tickets. Why the opposition parties want to see the paper trail. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. Reaction from the campaign trail now to an exclusive story that aired last night on Here and Now. Did a Liberal MHA pressure a local skating club into giving up 34 free tickets to see Caitlin Osmond last year in Marystown? Now, we reported on emails from Mark Brown's office last night on our newscast. Now, Brown is the MHA for Placentia West, Bellevue. And last March, his assistant, Tara Plank, wrote the local skating club saying the government was looking for almost three dozen tickets to see the Osmond Ice Show, adding... There will be some monetary donations being given to the Ice Crystals Skating Club from the government. Now that monetary donation took the form of a $1,500 grant to the Ice Crystals, a grant the club never asked for. PC leader Chess Crosby says if Liberals bought the tickets fair and square, they need to show the receipts. I say that in an election period, with a government with this kind of track record of favoring their friends, they don't get the benefit of the doubt. They need to show the proof, show the documentation that proves the tickets were purchased. And if, if you can't produce that, pro uh, that proof, what would you say should be done here? Then Mr. Brown is in violation of the Code of Conduct, if that's what happened, and maybe lots of other people in the Liberal Party are as well. And the voters are going to have to make their minds up whether they tolerate that kind of behavior. In a statement yesterday, Mark Brown insisted he's done nothing wrong. The Premier gave me clear direction last spring to purchase tickets for the event. The tickets used by me and my guests were purchased. There were no free tickets. NDP leader Allison Coffin says if Brown was acting at the direction of the Premier to buy hundreds of dollars worth of tickets for Liberal colleagues, there should be proper paperwork. Certainly I would have liked to have seen receipts being held and a, a statement of account somewhere that an accountant should have some record of that and it should have been declared. Certainly no one has been able to find those receipts so far, not to my knowledge. So far, no receipts. CBC wrote Mr. Brown this morning and asked him to produce proof for the tickets that he says he bought. 34 tickets at $20 would produce a receipt of $680. And this afternoon, Mr. Brown sent this brief answer. No receipt was issued. It was a personal expense. No receipt required. So on the one hand, the MHA says he bought the Osmond Ice Show tickets that were given to his Liberal colleagues. There were no freebies. There are no receipts. But that account doesn't square with his assistant's email to the Ice Crystal Skating Club. Her email indicated that the tickets were not bought, but rather were granted in exchange for that $1,500 money again that the club never asked for. With the extra funds that we can secure for the club, the granting of these tickets will be more than covered from a monetary perspective. Now, we wanted a comment from Dwight Ball, but uh, he had no campaign events during the day today. But one of Ball's spokespeople did tell us that Mark Brown is the lead person to speak on this matter. And one last note for tonight, at least on this story, both the NDP and the Conservatives say they were not offered any tickets to attend last year's ice show. Construction on the Team Guju Highway has come to a halt. The government says it hasn't got the land. Landowners say they're in the dark. That story in five minutes on Here and Now. Cool and windy day across the province today. You see those temperatures only reaching a high near two degrees for parts of the Avalon and then not even breaking the zero degree mark for most of the West Coast. Now, as we head through the next couple of hours, we are going to see some clearing skies, which is certainly good news. Already starting to see some peaks of sun in the mix, but then we've got some more snow on the way for the West Coast. Snowfall warnings in place mention that risk of heavy snow, uh, especially for the higher elevations, gross morn up through Cartwright and then uh, Makovic also under those warnings tonight. And you can see as this area of low pressure, which has been essentially stalled here for the past couple of days, uh, will continue to do so and bring in those periods of snow as we head through the overnight tonight and then through the day tomorrow as well. I'll tell you how much snow is on the way and I'll have your forecast looking towards the weekend when I come back. 
To some horrible news now, a man from this province has been killed in a workplace accident at an oil sand site north of Fort McMurray. He died yesterday at the Suncor site. The man's name has not been released, but Suncor says in a statement that the man was involved in a vehicle accident at the site and several investigations are now taking place. An RNC constable convicted of obstruction of justice has received a suspended sentence and a year's probation. Joe Smythe was sentenced in court this morning. Here are now Mark Quinn reports. Red-eyed, tired-looking and unshaven, suspended RNC constable Joe Smythe arrived in court to hear his sentence today. Judge Mike Madden gave Smythe a suspended sentence with a year on probation. That means no jail time for Smythe, but he will continue to have a criminal record. Smythe was convicted earlier this year for issuing a false traffic ticket. Today, Madden said Smythe had breached the public's trust, but he also said he doesn't believe Smythe will reoffend. Madden said his decision was influenced by the testimony of a psychologist who treated Smythe. Marina Hewlett diagnosed Smythe with post-traumatic stress disorder following his fatal shooting of Don Dumphy in 2015. She also said in court that Smythe should not have been back on street duty in 2017 when he ticketed the motorcycle driver. One of the four tickets he gave the driver was for running a red light, but video shot from the driver's bike shows the light was clearly green. Smythe has been suspended without pay from the RNC since he was charged in 2017. His lawyer, Jerome Kennedy, has filed notice that he's appealing the obstruction of justice conviction. The appeal is scheduled to be heard in June. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. The Progressive Conservatives launched their Book of Election Promises today. The Blue Book includes plans to subsidize childcare, repeal taxes, and also to call in an external auditor to review the provincial government's expenses. Here now is Garrett Barry joins us live in our studio tonight to break down the details. So Garrett, where should we start? There's an awful lot in this policy book, so let's start with some of the big ticket items. Here's a list of new expenses that will ring over $10 million each. The biggest cost of the provincial wallet will be the repeal of the sales tax on all insurance premiums. That includes homeowners insurance. That those changes alone will cost about $110 million. You also have the repeal of the deficit reduction levy, something that Crosby says he'll do before the Liberal Party would. You add all of those together and you're looking at about $253.9 million in new spending. How is all that going to be paid for? Crosby is counting on the Hibernia dividend money, the $134.9 million that will be paid out every year until 2056. The PCs also say there will be about $80 million in new revenue, much of that from the offshore royalty growth. You can add about $39 million in government efficiencies and you end up with funding for all of Crosby's new promises. <laughs> so that's his new stuff. But what about the deficit the province already runs? He says he's got a plan for that, too. What we eventually opted for is a gradual approach that balances the budget at the end of the first, first four-year mandate. It happens to be the time when the Liberals claim they will balance, balance their budget, 22-23. The question for the public is, who do you believe? Who do you think is actually going to do it? That plan involves a full external audit of government, including NALCOR, and looking for more from the federal government. There's a social transfer, there's a health transfer, and in our view, there's $80 million that should be coming to us extra from that. And I'll use the figure $316 million when we properly apply the offset in this year alone in terms of the Atlantic Accord and equalization. And here's something that may affect your bottom line. The PC campaign promising cost controls for daycare. They say if elected, some families will spend no more than $25 a day. And if you qualify, you could pay nothing. Because we're losing population. And that's part of the strategy to draw the line on that and return our population to growth. We must have young families laying out uh, plans to make this their home for the foreseeable future and on beyond that. Now in this campaign blue book, Crosby also laid out a plan for the first 200 days should he take office. It includes a task force on health care, installing moose fencing on roadways in this province, 
and bringing in some sort of new policy on school busing rules. Carolyn? Thanks, Garrett. That's here now's Garrett Berry reporting. And the Liberals are already reacting to the PC Blue Book. Liberal candidate Tom Osborne is taking issue with how the Tories plan to use the Hibernia Dividend Fund. He said his party will use the money to lower the provincial government's borrowing requirement, which he calls the better way to go. But if you're, if you're going to take the Atlantic Accord money and use it for other things, as they've identified in their book, well, then you're back to having to borrow that money because instead of keeping the, the debt payment down, you have to borrow it. You know, so it's this mismanagement and it's the desperation to borrow people's support in this election by promising everything to everybody. Party leaders are getting ready for the first debate of the election season. The Federation of Labor is hosting a forum tonight in St. John's. Here now is Katie Breen. We'll be watching that debate. So, Katie, how's it looking over there right now? Well, they're just getting set up here now. It's about an hour away to the debate. Debate's happening tonight from 7 to 9 down at the Delta Hotel. All four leaders are going to be here. It's the first time that they're going to be squaring off. I'm joined now by Mary Shortle, the president of the Federation of Labor, the group that's hosting the event tonight. What are you expecting to come out of this? Well, um, union membership is, uh, is pretty high in Newfoundland and Labrador. We have the highest density in the whole country at 38 percent. So I'd expect that the leaders would want to hear. That's a big demographic. Uh, I'd expect they want to hear what it is that concerns our members and their families. And what we want is our members and their families to make good votes, good choices at the, at the uh, ballot box. So it's important that uh, the issues that concern them, the issues that keep them awake at night get addressed and they'll have an opportunity to ask uh, the four candidates where they are and hopefully then on May 16th they'll make a, a good educated vote on uh, who they want to represent them. What's the most important issue to you? Well, to the Federation, we've been, you know, we, we've always been vocal about our concerns for a strong economy that, that doesn't leave anybody behind. And our vision of that strong economy includes good jobs, quality public services. It includes, you know, environmental sustainability, but sustainability of our communities as well. Uh, it's about fairness and equality. You know, we're concerned about the wage gap. We're concerned about the gender gap. Um, and that we hear that from our members as well. So those issues hopefully will be addressed. Through. We have some questions that we're going to ask, but the majority of the questions will be asked by um, our members if they're in the audience or the public who are in the audience. So it'll be uh, very interesting to see where, uh, where the parties are on all those issues. I saw the ballot box over there, so I guess people can just slot their, their They can in. slot them in. We did that because, uh, you know, we, we only have 90 minutes and we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the questions get asked and people don't spend a lot of time on the mic or be nervous about it. So they'll put their questions in. We have uh, some of the staff from our office who will go through them and they'll give them to the moderator. and. Uh, We'll, we'll try and get as many questions in a 19 minute period as we can. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So if you're not in this room tonight, the debate is going to be streamed on the Federation of Labor's Facebook page. And of course, we'll have a televised debate tomorrow night. That's back at the CBC station right after here and now from seven o'clock until eight. Live in St. John's, I'm Katie Breen for here and now. Campaign 2019 is at the halfway point and it's time to find out where the parties stand on the issues. On Wednesday, May 1st, the leaders of the three main parties face off in the 2019 media debate. Journalists from CBC, NTV and The Telegram will push the leaders on a variety of issues. The debate starts at 7 o'clock. You can watch live on CBC TV, online and CBC Radio. The 2019 media debate, Wednesday, 7 o'clock, 6.30 in Labrador. Well, construction of the Teen Guju Highway has practically ground to a halt. That's due to a shortage of land. The government said earlier this month it doesn't own the land required to finish the highway. But given the Teen Guju Highway was announced more than eight years ago, some of the landowners are wondering what's going on. Here are now Cease Hare explains. Construction work on Team Guju Highway stops right here at Brookfield Road because the provincial government doesn't have the land it needs that way. On this side of Brookfield Road is federal agriculture land. On the other side, further down, private land is in the way. On budget day two weeks ago, Transportation Minister Steve Crocker said before Team Guju Highway goes any further, land ownership issues have to be sorted out. We have to first get our land issues straightened out 
when we get all of that done, our engineers can finalize what those tie-ins are going to look like, and, and it's really, uh, there's, there's quite a big piece of work there to be done. Doug Manston owns property near Heavy Tree Road, where Team Guzhu Highway ramps or the highway itself will likely go, and he's frustrated. Where do things stand between you and the provincial government now? Well, I've got a clue. <laughs> they won't tell me anything. And have you tried? Tried? I've been trying now for, <laughs> for a long time, but no one seems to know anything. He's not alone. Other landowners say lack of communication with government is unsettling, especially since diagrams float around showing possible routes going through parts of their property and also considering that the government now owns a lot of private land around them. Over the years, the province has been busy buying some private property around Brookfield Road and the Heavy Tree Road area. Manston sold lots to the province along Heavy Tree Road, but he kept a 50-foot wide access from the road to a huge field in the back, and now he's worried the access will be expropriated. Is you're concerned that if you lose this access, uh, you lose access to this big open field behind you. The fire I'm not going to lose that until such times I get paid or something for that behind. I'll guarantee you, because well, they can't trap me. We contacted the Department of Transportation and Works about the land issues in this area for the highway, and we were told they would not be commenting because it would be inappropriate to do so during the election campaign. CSAIR, CBC News, St. John's. Well, lots of debate around the Simpsons Canadian-themed episode on Sunday and the uh, fun that it poked at this province, which offended a lot of people. Yeah, and now to a story about one man from this province who could have earned $20,000 U.S. from that episode, but he refused to license his song. So the Simpsons writers had to come up with their own Newfoundland-sounding song. Yeah, that's the song the writers came up with, but they had actually wanted to license the Islander from songwriter Bruce Moss. Yes, that song was released in the early 80s and is still played in pubs and shows by traditional Newfoundland music groups, but Moss wouldn't let the Simpsons use this song. Let me ask you. Islander born and bred and I'll be one till I die. I'm proud to be an Islander and here's the reason why. Of course, I was interested at first because I have in the past uh, license it to uh, people in the States. Uh, and uh, so anyway, when he mentioned it was The Simpsons, uh, that's when the conversation basically ended. Because I said, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in, uh, you know, anything to do with The Simpsons, basically. Because they don't support the values that I do. I'm not sorry I didn't license it. And after uh, what I've been told about this episode, I'm, I'm really happy I didn't. Well, not a, a lot, lot of money. people. Yeah, not a lot of people would actually have stand by their principles and do that. Yeah. You know, when the Simpsons and Hollywood comes knocking and all that. So twenty uh, thousand dollars U.S. Yeah. yeah. And we know that most of that money went to taking care of kids with really complex needs. Reporter Megan McCabe joins us after the weather to walk us through some of the numbers of concern. Yes, her story is about the rising number of young people in this province who need highly involved care.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. People, yeah, there you are. Uh, <laughs> I've been cold all day. Oh. This has been one of those days. For some reason, the cold just kind of goes right through you. The, all the India. wind yeah. and everything. It's the wind. It certainly yeah. is. And I mean, temperatures aren't very nice out there yeah. either. Uh, well below seasonal. If you take a look at what we're sitting at right now, it's uh, only about one degree for uh, most of the at least northeast coast. Even cooler as we head towards central and then. Um, up through Labrador, it's actually the warmest. So Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around two degrees. Lab City sitting around minus five. Now uh, we mentioned those winds, strong winds for most areas, particularly though the Avalon and uh, down for the Buren as well. Pretty strong winds, Gus. Uh, topped out right now, or topped out this afternoon, I should say, around 96 kilometers per hour for St. John's. Uh, Cape Race recorded an 83 kilometer per hour gust, and then we can see those stronger winds up through St. Anthony as well. And because of those winds and those cool temperatures, wind chills right now sitting uh, in the minus single digits, so minus eight across the board, and then St. Anthony feeling closer to minus 10. Now, the good news is these winds will eventually ease slightly as we head through the overnight, but uh, still looking at some strong winds. And as far as uh, what we're seeing on the satellite and radar, we are seeing some snow along the west coast and the northeast coast as well. That will continue to uh, track a little bit further east as we head through the night tonight as that low pressure system brings some more snow uh, along the northeast coast, along the west coast, and then coastal Labrador as well in the higher elevations. Uh, some models are pointing at upwards of about 50 centimeters of snow. So quite significant amounts uh, through the overnight tonight. And here's a look at your temperature. So not dipping much from what we're seeing now, just a couple more degrees, but again, gonna stay windy uh, for the most part out of the west at 30 to 50 kilometer per hour gusts, a little stronger uh, for the northeast coast between 60 and maybe even 70 kilometer per hour gusts overnight tonight. Otherwise, we're looking at that slight chance of flurries along the northeast coast. Uh, Buren and the Avalon will likely stay uh, partly cloudy, so we could see some breaks uh, through the overnight tonight. Minus 11 for Labrador City and then either rain or snow hovering around the zero degree mark for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then same for the Straits. Cartwright is under that snowfall warning as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. So here's a look at what we're expecting as far as snowfall accumulation by tomorrow morning. Uh, somewhere between 10 to 15 centimeters of snow, higher elevations closer to 25 and you're seeing that along the uh, coastal Labrador as well moving forward in time tomorrow through Thursday morning or early Thursday morning rather again those accumulations between 30 to 50 centimeters so no surprise why we have that uh, snowfall warning there otherwise if we go quickly through tomorrow still unsettled across the island and up through Labrador those temperatures though will be much nicer so into the minus or rather single digits tomorrow uh, which means the snow will change over to the chance of showers in the afternoon we're going to see that right through uh, Grand Falls Windsor as well Harbor Breton though down through the south coast plenty of sunshine it looks like and then again with those onshore flurries uh, higher elevations again 30 to 50 centimeters down towards uh, sea level closer to five centimeters and then uh, the straits again pretty messy along the coast northwesterly winds gusting upwards of about 70 kilometers per hour and then through lab city flurries just flurries tomorrow and sitting around minus two so let's look at your forecast we'll look ahead when i come back the number of young people in this province in need of complex care is spiking. Over the past two years, it's ballooned so much that government has blown through its budget, spending way more than it planned. Here now, Megan McCabe is here, and uh, you've been looking into this with the CBC Investigates team. So, Megan, why has government been so surprised by this? Well, on the simplest level, it comes down to cash, and that's actually how we noticed that there was this two-year spike in spending. The Department of Children, Seniors and Social Development spent nearly $11 million more than it had anticipated in 2017. Most of that money went to taking care of kids with really complex needs. And what are complex needs? Yeah, it's kind of general. So it's basically kids with uh, mental health issues, maybe some medical issues. They can't live at home, so they live in group homes with staff or on their own in a home with staff. And then the government pays two private companies 
space for the bulk of that staffed housing. So when the minister, Lisa Dempster, was asked about this nearly $11 million spike in spending in 2017, she was direct. The increased cost is directly attributable to uh, the growth in the number of level four placements as a result of um, an increase in the number of children with complex needs requiring care. Okay, some institutional lingo uh, there. What exactly does level four placement mean? Yeah, it uh, sounds kind of general. So basically, it's kids with those really specific needs, um, mental health or medical, or sometimes it's an emergency situation. So level four is for kids who cannot live in a family-based environment. And so it's also the most critical level within the system. So those are the most complex cases handled by by private companies, but how much money are we talking about here? They spent nearly 11 million more than expected back in 2017, and it happened again in 2018, but even worse, uh, 15 million more than originally planned. And we're talking big money here. It's out of a total of about $73 million spent on this stuff in 2018. That's a lot of money. Uh, how many young people are involved with this? Out of roughly a thousand kids in care, 155 of them are these level four placements with complex needs. Okay, so why, why so many? What's going on? So I talked to Sheldon Pollitt at Choices for Youth to get some insight into this, and he said that these numbers match what they're seeing, with a spike in the number of 16-year-olds showing up at their emergency shelter, and more young people going to them overall, up to 70% of whom have had some connection to the child welfare system, often aging out of it into the income support and criminal justice systems. That's a significant portion of you know, the youth in our community showing up in very precarious, vulnerable situations. Um, you know, the reality of it is no young person is coming to Choice of Youth because life is great and this is a fun thing to do. Young people end up coming to us for support and services around some pretty complex needs. Um, could be housing, you know, often driven by mental health and addictions, obviously family breakdown, the, the significant uh, rates of, you know, you know, traumatic childhood experiences that young people are left to kind of try and deal with as, as they, you know, age into adulthood. And, and if you don't provide the right supports, uh, it's very difficult to do that for them to do that in a healthy way. So it sounds like the spending growth is part of a much bigger problem with not just a financial cost, but also a social one. Right, what we're talking about here is a lot of kids and families in crisis, and Paulette says the key is to help stop them from reaching that crisis point or becoming level four. So he's optimistic that the new legislation coming into effect in June will help address some of these issues, and that's what the department says as well, and that it is working to, quote, reverse the level four trend increase. Okay, thanks for breaking this down for us, Megan. Thank you. And so those people are also asking for their money, just adding on to the money that we've already owed everybody else, and it's just digging us further down. We can't exactly say how much, but it, it is a lot, a lot of money. Well, the bills are piling up in Rigolette, and the creditors are looking for money. Carolyn chats with the town councillor about why the town is cutting its losses and shutting down the local gas station.
Well, residents of Rigolette are facing a difficult situation. The town has decided to no longer run the community's only gas station. Now, the council took over the operation when the owner pulled out, but that was supposed to be for only a few months. But it's been 13 years, and the station has been a huge drain on the town's finances. So joining me now to talk more about this is uh, town councillor Chelsea Morris. So thank you so much for being here. No problem. So the town has been providing gasoline to the community for over a decade. So why pull out now? It's just come to the point that when once we took it over in January 4th, 2006, we were told it was going to be a short term stint from six months to a year. Um, 13 years later, constantly having um, issues uh, financially, we can no longer continue our business which isn't typically a business anyways under the responsibility of the town community. So what are the issues here? Is it just there's not enough people buying enough gas for it to be profitable? There's a lot more to a gas station than what people think. It's not simply just buying the gas from a supplier and selling it for the same price. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, here in Riglet, our positions are um, actually unionized. So we pay very good money for a gas attendant as well as a relief worker when necessary. Through Canada Revenue Agency, there is um, audits that need to be done because it's a business that's separate from our typical town duties. All those fees are taken into account. There's a lot more than just selling gas. And we were told that our gas station would profit if we sold more than gas, such as food, such as um, skidoo parts, vehicle parts. Maybe if we had a garage added onto that. But at this point in time, we don't have the resources, the staff, or the money to do that to open our business larger. It doesn't really fall under a town responsibility. Therefore, we need to just stop. Right. How, how much of a drain has this been on the town's finances? We've also had loans from NG to help dig us out of this hole for past years. And so those people are also asking for their money, just adding on to the money that we've already owed everybody else. And it's just digging us further down. We can't exactly say how much, but it, it is a lot, a lot of money. Okay, so how will the town recoup those losses? Unfortunately, due to closing the gas station, we've also had to have a few layoffs. Um, I mean, we had to get rid of our gas attendant as well as our um, relief worker at this point. I would assume that selling the tanks and the equipment that goes with it will help us. Um, other than that, we're just dipping into our everyday funds um, that typically should be spent on services for the community. So how is this going to work uh, for the community? Uh, how are people going to find gas now? It's a solution that all of us are wondering and haven't found. Um, we know that there are other communities in the province that don't have a gas supplier, but they have managed to solve their problems in some way. What would be the ideal solution, do you think? In my opinion, I honestly think that because of our economic development um, corporations within New Nazi Vote Government, I would really hope that somebody within the community could open the business personally, maybe add on to it, open a garage, open different skidoo and vehicle parts that would be beneficial to the community as well. Um, and someone actually benefit financially within this community or within New Nazi Um, But honestly, we're open to any suggestions or opinions that are going to help us in the future. All right, Chelsea Morris, good luck with it. And thanks so much for speaking with us today. Thanks so much for having me. The 201st running of the Royal St. John's Regatta is just months away and the boathouse is now open. But there's a lot going on down here at Kitty Bitty Lake. If those people that are walking Kitty Bitty could use the other parking lots on the north side of the pond, we'd be greatly appreciative of that. I'm Jeremy Eaton and I'll tell you all about it it's coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, the boathouse at Kitty Vitty Lake in St. John's is open for another season, but athletes are sharing the space with construction mm -hmm. workers. Following the success of the 200th running of the Royal St. John's Regatta, the docks and parking lot, well, they're getting a major overhaul. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has that story. High winds bring out the red flag, meaning no one is out on the water today. But that doesn't mean people aren't hard at work. The boathouse is under construction. We have a, a new winter circle being installed out front, a new dock uh, up through the side of the pond, and of course some work over on the north side of the pond for the vendors, as well as a dock over there uh, at the marquee. The facelift will make the space a little bigger, make life easier for people around the lake on Regatta Day, and create more of a park-like feel. A benefit for all Kitty Vitty visitors, but it leaves rowers bearing the brunt of the construction season. The rowers are going to be impacted. Uh, we have a limited space for our boats for the next couple of months, uh, but we will work with the, the rowers to make sure they get out and get their spins in. Uh, but parking is the major issue here. Parking will be a bit of a problem too, as the redesign will limit the number of spaces. We recognize that we share Kitty Vitty Lake with thousands of people each summer. Um, if those people that are walking Kitty Vitty or utilizing for another purpose other than rowing, rowing could use the other parking lots on the north side of the pond, we'd be greatly appreciative of that. Much like the sport, it takes a team to make this happen. Money coming in from the federal and provincial coffers, as well as more than $1.2 million from the city of St. John's. So this is part of the legacy project of our 200th anniversary. It's a partnership by uh, various levels of government and of course the Regatta Committee and the City of St. John's and we're very proud to see this work taking place now on the heels of our 200th anniversary and it will uh, ensure that we have a beautiful park-like setting uh, for, uh, for generations to come. Power says the construction project will be finished later this summer and everything will be in place by Regatta Day so that people can come down and enjoy the new look here at Kitty Bitty Lake. The boats here behind me are all ready to go. All the rowers need is a lot less wind than we had today. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, that would be great to see us kind of spruced yeah. up area around the lake. Right? Yeah, big job too. Mm, definitely. Mm.
Okay, it's Tuesday. I was gonna almost say it was Thursday. But I was whoa. Say that too. I was like, wait, oh, yeah, no, it's Thursday. Just it is kidding. Tuesday, and that means <laughs> it's Weather with Kid Day. So our newest member is Claire Smith, and this is her photo. She's five year, or rather, her drawing. She's five years old from Frenchman's Cove, Sweet. and she likes the rainy uh, weather the best. Yeah. And I'm going to assume it's because. She clearly like splashing in those puddles. <laughs> nice. I like rainy weather best. That's a great Aww. attitude. Yeah, and oh, wow. there she is there. Beautiful. Thank great you. Great job. Claire. Yes, thank you so much for sending that drawing in. And she it looks like a mini Ashley. <laughs> Actually, even she's, she's even wearing the same outfit. Say that. She's kind of wearing the same outfit. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Thank you so much for sending that in. So if you want to be part of our Weather Whiz Kid Club, uh, send your drawing, your photo, your address, and uh, I'll send you a postcard in the mail yeah. to nlphotos at cbc.ca. All right. Mm -hmm. So looking ahead to the long range. Yeah, we're going to go into uh, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday's forecast. And uh, it looks like this low pressure system is going to continue to stick around. So we're going to have to see that for the next uh, little bit there and uh, that means it's going to stay unsettled through the day on Thursday. So the south shore though will actually see uh, some sunshine which is the case through the day tomorrow as well and then uh, we're going to continue to see that snow along the Labrador coast again through the afternoon. Not quite as intense though uh, particularly around uh, Cartwright we're going to see that pick back up again though Thursday night rather. And then for the island, you can see uh, as those temperatures climb, better chance of seeing some showers through the day, which is certainly good news. And eventually that low will slowly start to make its way offshore. But uh, again, going to stay unsettled, it looks like, for the most part through the day on Thursday. So here's a look at the forecast. Temperatures climbing a little bit. So back to uh, the single digits again, mid single digits for the West Coast. Six degrees for Cornerbrook. Port Basque will see sunshine and five degrees again along the South Coast. Marystown uh, likely looking at a few showers, but otherwise some peaks of sun there as well. Seven degrees and then up through uh, Labrador. Mild five degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Three for Lab City with that potential for a few flurries. And then uh, uh, we're going to see a little bit cooler along the coast, but still above zero. Cartwright sitting around two degrees. So here's that low pressure system. As it continues to track a little bit further, we will start to see some clearing uh, at times through the afternoon on Friday, hanging on to that chance of uh, showers along the northeast coast. And then the next system will make uh, the chance or will move in for the weekend for Labrador. So we're looking at that chance of flurries for Lab City and then spreading. Uh, across to the coast into the afternoon and with those temperatures still going to be quite warm. It looks like we should see that change over to rain and then for lab or for the island first half of Saturday looks OK and then we start to get a little bit unsettled uh, into Sunday morning and it looks like eventually that will clear out Sunday afternoon. So that's certainly good news there. But as far as the next five days goes, those temperatures will be sitting above zero. So breezy tomorrow and again through the day on Thursday. Finally going to see some sunshine. It looks like on Saturday and then Sunday the first half as well with that slight chance of a few showers and sitting around eight degrees. It does look like it will get warmer for central Newfoundland as we head towards the weekend and then uh, again for western Newfoundland. Same thing. So warm towards Saturday with some showers in the morning that sun uh, moving in which is why I've bumped up those temperatures a few degrees and then for uh, eastern Labrador three degrees tomorrow snow changing to the chance of showers and then uh, we're looking at about five six degrees through the rest of the week and then same thing for western Labrador uh, that snow though on Saturday as I mentioned will change over to rain through the afternoon and that's because those temperatures will be sitting around four degrees and then it looks like finally some sunshine on Sunday and six so that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Turning now to some national news. Thousands of demonstrators are voicing their anger over cuts to Ontario's health care. They staged a mass protest outside Queen's Park in Toronto. We're all here together and I think even Doug Ford supporters are opposed to the cuts that he's making and I think that's the message we're also putting in that um, it doesn't matter what party you support, it's about these cuts are going to hurt everybody. The progressive conservative government has recalculated a key funding formula. Many of Toronto's health programs used to receive 75% of their funding from the province and 25% from the city. That ratio will now shift to a 50-50 split. Toronto says it will result in a billion dollar loss over a decade. The province disagrees though, saying it will be less than half that. A new premier and cabinet have been sworn in today in Alberta. 
I do, so help me God. Jason Kenney, the leader of the United Conservative Party, becomes the 18th Premier of Alberta. The new session of the provincial legislature kicks off next month. And Kenney says his first legislative act as Premier will be to repeal the previous NDP government's carbon tax. To international news now, Japan is witnessing history being made. Emperor Akihito has abdicated the throne, paving the way for his son. In his final address as emperor, Akihito thanked his people for their support during his 30-year reign and wished peace and prosperity for his country. Akihito officially remains emperor until midnight, and then his son, Crown Prince Nerhito, takes over. It's the first time in 200 years that a Japanese emperor has stepped down. The 85-year-old made the decision to abdicate almost three years ago, and at that time he cited his health as well as his age. Well, back at home now, a Winnipeg photographer has some uh, pretty squirrely ideas. Yes, you're going to just have to see it to believe it. Here's some backyard wisdom from Deb Vokey. Well, I'm a retired civil servant, and I'm a photographer. I love nature, and I've been photographing for many years. As a photographer, you're always looking to challenge yourself. And somebody had sent me a picture of a squirrel standing next to a Barbie bike. Well, this is the cutest thing I ever saw. And I thought, you know what? I think I can do this. When I build my diorama, I have an idea where I want him to be. And I want him to look human-like, meaning I want him to stand on his hind legs. I have to or peanuts in the diorama in places that get him standing up. Other dioramas, I use peanut butter. So peanut butter keeps him in the scene. He licks the peanut butter, and then he pops his head up and looks around. I knew I was going to have to photograph him inside my house. So I was in the middle of planning a kitchen renovation and made sure that I got the perfect window to photograph from. And then, once, he stopped in the doorway. So inspiration for the dioramas comes from life. I have several dioramas that I have been working on over the winter. I've done a diorama for Remembrance Day, a, a bugle for the squirrel to look like he's playing. Now I know, like, how can you get him to do that? I'm going to hang it from strings. I'm going to put peanut butter on the end of it so that he reaches up to lick the peanut butter and look like he's playing it. Got a fire truck with an extension ladder so he's going to become a fireman. figured out what else to put in the scene for that just yet. But when I go to bed at night, these are the things I think about. <laughs> well, we all need a hobby. Right. <laughs> Very creative, though. Yeah, it's cute. Yeah. I like it. Well, here's a beautiful photo. Uh, looks very summer-like. Can't wait to see that. <laughs> Since yeah. there's still so much snow in the forecast. Uh, but yeah, here's a look at your uh, weather photo of the day. I will tell you where this photo was taken and you took it when we come back. Yeah, what jumped into the water there? Exactly. Gorgeous shot. Mm-hmm.
Welcome back. Well, tomorrow, the big debate right after here and now, the media debate with the leadership candidates, right? Yep. It's midpoint of the campaign. And we want to do our part to combat voter apathy. You can cast your ballot in the provincial election on Thursday, May the 16th. So that means you've got to get your voter card and make sure that your ID is all up to date. Yeah, the comedy gang at the outhouse has put together this guide on how to vote. I'm kind of scared to watch. <laughs> Welcome to Shed News. It's voting season, boys. So today we're going to teach you how to vote because we're responsible role models. Yeah, that's right. You want some arsehole in and arsehole out? You got to register to vote. So let's get started, shall we? Step one, boys, you got to register with Elections NL in order to vote. Registration could be done when you go in to vote or you could just register online, like right now. Did you say erections or elections? Oh no, let me clarify, Boz. I said elections. Step two, call this toll-free number or email to see if you are on the voters list. Boz, am I on the voters list? Yes, me, buddy. All right, that's best going then. You can also contact them this way if you recently turned 18, the missus kicked you out, you're a mainlander becoming a Newfoundlander, or you changed your name to Lassie Bar. Step three. If you're gonna get out there and vote, boys, you gotta meet all these requirements. You gotta be one of the boys. And by that, I mean you gotta be a Canadian citizen. And you gotta be at least 18 years old to vote. And you gotta be at least 19 years old to have a beer while you're voting. Can you say that? I don't know. And you gotta be a resident of Newfoundland in the district where you're voting. I mean, no shit, Sherlock. Wait, can you say shit on the news? I wouldn't say no. All right, and that's it for us. Back to you, Whitney. Yes. Sorry, Nan. Sorry, Thank Nan. you. <laughs> Thank you for the advice. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yep. Elections in L getting very modern for this uh, election campaign. All right, let's try to find a segue for that advice about what I'm supposed to get off of to vote. Yeah. Uh, let's get to a feel-good story, all right? And that always means finding some way to get a moose into a Newfoundland Labrador story. This is one that didn't result in one of them becoming dinner. Check this out. A driver on an Ontario highway pulled over when she saw this off the side of the road, that massive moose stuck in what appears to be a muddy creek. Okay, five men used ropes to help haul the animal out, and after several hours, it trotted off into the woods to freedom. That's, that's a good story. Yeah, Let's whatever, say hello, story. thanks, and then uh, off it goes. <laughs> I love those stories when yep. people save animals like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Looks like a happy A lot of moose. work, too, pulling yeah. a big animal out of a bog like mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah. Six hours. Six hours. That's a lot of pulling. Yep. Anyhow, mm -hmm. happy ending. Determination. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we what go. What a photo. Beautiful shot there, quickly. There we go. And now the ocean, yep. Yep, pretty close. Cottlesville. Ah. Connellsville. Yeah, Connellsville. I guess okay. the fish are out. It looks like oh, that, or it's a stone. I don't. I can't. Really I know. think it's a photographer, yeah, a photographer saying, "You know what? Exactly. If I Let's make this look little. pretty." If I throw this and click really quickly, yeah. I'm going to have mm -hmm. a nice shot that actually tells a little bit of a story, it's and they true. can all guess what it is. That's right. But it was beautiful. A beautiful, clearly Sunday evening. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy Wheeler, for sending that photo in. Yeah. And if you want to share any of your beautiful weather photos or just out and about, send them to NL Photos at cbc.ca. Right. There you go. So don't forget the debate right after here and now tomorrow night where the uh, three leaders will, of course, hash out the uh, issues of the campaign. Mm -hmm. 7 o'clock, 6.30, most parts of Labrador. Yeah, and all the media taking part, uh, mm -hmm. MTV, The Telegram, and CBC. Right, and don't forget you can get that on radio as well, as of course on television and YouTube. So uh, check it out. Big moment in the election campaign. Good night, everyone. Good night.